Good afternoon, and welcome to our first event of the speakers program for the spring quarter. Our guest today is Mr. Julian Bond, one of the founders of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He is a Georgian legislator, and uh, as an example of racism in America, he was elected to the Georgia House. They refused to seat him. They held another election, refused to seat him again after winning for the second time. Holding a third election, they still refused to seat him, and the Supreme Court stepped in, <laughs> big deal, and uh, declared it unconstitutional, and they had him seated. He is famous, or notorious, I guess, for um, when he stood up to Lester Maddox at the 68th convention in Chicago. Would you please welcome Mr. Julian Bond? Thank you a great deal. It's usually the custom of most speakers to begin by telling the audience what a great pleasure it is to be here. And so it is a great pleasure to be here. Before I begin, let me say that uh, I am a politician and tend to make political speeches. And I know that the uh, profession I practice is not a very popular one among young people in general and probably among the public at large. Uh, and many times when I've made speeches, I've been accused of uh, not making a real speech, but just engaging in an anti-Nixon diatribe. And I actually resent that because I like to think I'm really just presenting an objective look of what life is like in the United States in 1973. But in order that no one misunderstand any prejudices or biases I may have, I ought to tell you that during the last campaign, I supported the candidate who lost. But I'm not a fool. I know that Nixon is the president. And so now I'm trying to do everything I can to get along with him as best I can. I want very badly for President Nixon to like me. In fact, I'm even trying to learn how to tap dance. Uh, now, one other thing, you probably people in Los Angeles know better than people in other parts of the country that during the course of a political campaign, very often the two opponents or two or three opponents and their supporters will call each other names that they really feel sorry for afterward. And that was the position I found myself in during the presidential race. I had the occasion to call President Nixon a liar, a thief, and a cheat. And really, now that the election is over, I'm sorry that I said all those things, because they are not always true. And I have been studying the president because he is going to be president for the next three years, next four years. And I think it'd be very wise for all of us to pay close attention to him so you can tell when he's telling a lie and when he's telling the truth. Now, you may not think you can tell, but if you watch a lot of people make speeches, you'll discover that they tend to give themselves away by the way they use their hands. If you can remember, President Kennedy used to uh, chop the air with his right hand like this when he was making a point, and late President Johnson used to sort of uh, flutter his fingers over the top of his head when he became excited about something, and President Nixon is just the same. So if you watch what he does with his hands, you get a real insight into his character. Now the next time you see him, which will probably be on TV because no one has seen him in the flesh for many, many years, the next time you see him, pay very close attention to what he does with his hands. If you see him take the thumb and the forefinger on his right hand and pull downward on his right earlobe like this, then that's a pretty sure bet that he's telling the truth. Or, if you see him take the forefinger on his left hand and stroke downward on his left nostril, then once again you can be pretty sure that he's telling the truth. Or if you see him use a gesture that a lot of people use uh, when they want someone to think they're saying something sort of profound, if you see him cradle his chin in either his right hand or his left hand, 
the way a lot of people do, then once again you know that he's telling the truth. But you have to be awfully careful when he opens his mouth. <laughs> no. I, uh, even though the election is some months past, I do want to talk about it. I think it instructive and revealing to the heart and soul of the United States. It is some months over. All of us know that the American voters, not all of them by any means, about half of those who could, went to the polls on the 7th of November, expressed their choice, and now all the rest of us have a chance to look back on why that choice was made, what it meant at the time, what it's likely to mean in the years ahead. Now the choice was many different things to many different people, but on its most basic level, it was a choice between the past performance of one fallible man and the unproved promises of another. But those of you who believe the Gallup and the Harris poll knew all along that the outcome was never in doubt. You knew that organized labor didn't like the liberal candidate, that white Southerners with the Wallace option shot away would go to Nixon, that the wealthy worried about taxes would probably do the same, that the middle class saw safer streets under Nixon, that the newly discovered white ethnics wanted to crack down on dissenters and deserters, that college students as a general rule can't stick to anything over a prolonged period of time, and that almost no identifiable group of American voters, except for black people, could be found to cast votes for George McGovern. So then, if the election on the 7th of November illuminated any kind of political movement at all, it was the movement of the comfortable, the callous, and the smug, closing their ranks and closing their hearts against the claims and calls to conscience put forward by the forgotten and unrepresented elements in American society. As the Reverend Jesse Jackson put it, the issue wasn't the bus, it was us. There is then something wrong with an American election that sees one candidate receiving nearly all of the black votes cast, another candidate receiving more than three quarters of the white votes cast. That doesn't describe a race between Democrats and Republicans or even a contest between two men named Nixon and McGovern. This was rather a national referendum on what has more politely been called the social issue. For black people in America, that election signal consigning nearly all of our hopes and dreams to an oblivion from which they may never emerge. It meant reinstalling in power those who believe in privilege for the powerful and neglect of the powerless. It meant giving a four-year free hand to the current occupants of Uncle Strom's cabin, a free hand to men who have demonstrated they have no concern for freedom of the press, the privacy of the individual, or for the constitutionally guaranteed civil rights and civil liberties we should all like to believe are taken for granted by those who govern us. During the campaign, the president asked for four more years <coughs> and got them. He can use these years to put new faces on the Supreme Court, to turn it back into the progressive social force it used to be, or to continue its current trend toward regression. He's going to continue, as he's doing now, to emasculate the budgets, to set the policies, to name the directors for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of State, the Department of Justice, and the Federal Bureau of Intimidation. He's going to continue to decide whether stocks go up or down, whether money is loose or tight, whether your weekly paycheck buys more or less, or indeed for a great many of you, whether you have any kind of paycheck at all. 
He has got, in fact, four more years in which to shape America to his mold, to recruit from the frightened a constituency against the forgotten, to shape his new majority into a force that will continue to rule through fear and division. Now, the last decade, the decade of the 60s, saw the perception black people had of our difficulty in this country change from our inability to eat hamburgers at F and W Woolworths to our inability to survive at all. While Superfly ran rampant, we continued to get the shaft. But 60s solutions to the sorrows of the 70s will not suffice. If the 60s demonstrated any lesson at all, it was that continuous struggle was possible under one set of circumstances. If the 70s demonstrate another truth, it is so far that struggle cannot be mounted or sustained at all. Part of the difficulty of dealing with the problem of race in this country is the differing and contradictory analyses people give of America's ills. About a year ago, one such group, the National Urban Coalition, which is kind of a liberal centrist group, tried to spell out what they thought was wrong in this country and what it took to set it right. America's illness, they said, which all of us feel in one way or another, has its roots in the distance between the national ideal and the national reality. The ideal, of course, is a country where everyone has an equal chance to perform, where jobs exist for everyone who wants one, where health care and personal safety are assured, where we live in harmony with each other, and where everyone has a decent place in which to live. The American reality, of course, is something radically different from that. All of us know that most American cities, except Los Angeles, are in trouble, that poverty continues in the middle of wealth, that unemployment is high, that malnutrition is widespread, that injustice does exist, that tensions do endure. In short, we know that our society doesn't function the way it might. But if we solve the greatest of our ills, the Urban Coalition says, and they define the greatest American ill as our paralysis of spirit and will, we can narrow the distance between what we have and what we want. Now, in their view, there are several generalist goals that the country ought to try to pursue in the future, have to try to achieve full employment with a high level of economic growth, have to try to provide everyone with an equal opportunity <coughs> to participate in the decision-making process, guarantee that no American goes without the basic necessities, those being food, shelter, health care, a healthy environment, and an adequate income. But in addition to their major goals, in addition to their definition of the paralysis of will as the greatest American ill, there is another goal much more desirable and another ill much more horrible. That ill is racism, the goal its containment or eradication. Now, everyone knows that there is one consuming problem that makes life in New York's Harlem, in Cleveland's Huff, in Atlanta's Vine City, or in any of America's other urban Atticas, where some men are held in bondage by some other men, both intolerable and insufferable. That single problem is race. It is race that elected our incumbent president four years ago, it is race that makes some Americans serve and die more readily than others in Vietnam. It is race that has made some children more educated than others. It is race, in fact, which colors all of our lives. But over the past several years, rather general liberal solutions to the problem of race, and therefore to the pathologies of society that spring from it, have been more than abundant. Of course, none of these rather utopian dreams will ever be achieved unless and until there is increased interest among the people who need them and among the people who want them in replacing the new and no longer silent majority 
with a noisy, militant, agitated majority movement of people, of the dispossessed, who will begin to seek political solutions to their political problems. Now that is a difficult prospect, as the last election showed. For a great many Americans, particularly for many young Americans, the possibility of an exchange of presidents on November the 7th meant nothing more than an exchange of photographs on the post office wall or on a dormitory wall dartboard. For black people, the election was a national referendum on us, on whether we would progress, whether we would run in place, or whether we would continue sliding backward as we have been doing since 1968. In those four years, we spent billions more on war. Over two million more Americans were added to the ranks of the unemployed. Inflation reduced our standard of living. Jesus. Elitist, sexist, and racist practices ran rampant, unchecked through public and private American life. These practices are not likely to be ended by some cataclysmic revolution anytime soon. They can rather be dented by hard work and concerted political and social action. That last has been the history of black people's lives in this country. Constant pressure and agitation, with or without allies, aimed at improving our condition. What has happened to us since the first black people came here the year before the Mayflower arrived is that almost everything has changed and almost nothing has changed. On the good side, we are no longer slaves. Next, we can sit down at lunch counters, we can sit downstairs at movie theaters, ride in the front of buses, register, vote, work, and go to school in places where we once could not. But in a great many ways, we are constantly discovering that things have managed either not to have changed at all, or in some perverse manner have managed to become much worse. A quick look at all of the facts and figures that show how well or how poorly a group of people are doing. The kinds of figures that measure infant mortality, median family income, life expectancy, all those figures demonstrate rather clearly that the average black American, while undeniably better off than his father was, is actually worse off when his statistics are compared to similar ones for white people. It is almost as though we are climbing a molasses mountain dressed in snowshoes while the rest of the country rides a rather leisurely ski lift to the top. It is these depressing figures, the human pathology that results from them, that causes so much discontent in black America today. The common perception is that over the years, the different strategies of Booker T. Washington, Dr. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, of Dr. King, of Malcolm X, the common perception has it that not only have these philosophies failed to deliver any appreciable material gains to the masses of black people, the different agitations these philosophies gave birth to, either a return to Africa, a struggle in the courts, a nonviolent thrust into the streets, a violent attempt at doing real injury to white America. All these have accustomed a great many people to believe that not only have black people got everything that we want, but half of what everyone else has too. But the problem so often erroneously referred to as America's black problem, in reality a massive white problem, continues. It continues despite wars on poverty and great societies and new frontiers, and will continue despite the new federalism. Its roots are deep in the fabric of the United States. They began with the rape of Africa, the stealing of child from mother, the separation of husband from wife, the imposition on a, of an alien religion on an already religious group of people. The roots involve the basest kind of prejudice, an economic system which has always believed that property is more important than people, 
The results of these have been to put in place us at the bottom of a ladder which in this country is supposed to lead to jobs, to homes, to education and security. It has made us the last to be hired and the first to be fired. It has, as any retrospective reading of the casualty list from Vietnam will show, made black young men first in war, last in peace, and seldom in the hearts of their countrymen. It gives black young people a chance to go to school for 12 years and emerge with a sixth grade education. It has put us on relief where we are called lazy and shiftless while 6,000 white American farmers receive $25,000 a year each and more not to farm. In short, we are in what you might call with some charity bad shape. The gains made on yesterday are vanishing today. The victories won in the wars of 54 and, six and 1960 are being negated by the winner of the Battle of 68 and the rout of 72. The question then remaining is will it continue to happen? The answer is instructive because what happens today in America happened once before in this country's history in the years just after Reconstruction. In both cases a president made a cynical deal not just with the uncivilized and unreconstructed South but with the national unreconstructed mentality that believed then, as it believes now, that the American social agenda ought not include those at the bottom of the ladder. The promises made that we would be included in the social and economic life of the nation were repudiated. The liberal crusaders for social justice and democracy became tired or involved in other concerns. The aspirations of and movement by black people began to be curtailed, not just by organized violence and barbarity, but by a series of legal and extra-legal maneuvers designed to make us less than political and economic equals. The guilt and indignation of some northern supporters of the southern drive for equality turned into an attitude of first cautious and now more open hostility as northern black people began to take seriously the claims of progress and began to look for visible signs in their own backyards, reversing this recession of political concern ought to be part of your agenda for the remainder of the 70s. To mount a serious and protracted struggle against the arrogant power that runs from the White House to the corporate boardroom to the city hall and county courthouse requires more than the partial presence of summer soldiers and occasional agitators. Among other things, it requires building an aggressive, militant, democratic, <coughs> with a small d, political movement, with its roots in black America, in coordination with others who are non-white and poor, in open-ended coalition with all those others in this country, who are tired of crime in the streets and crime in the suites, who want an end to welfare and capitalism for the poor and subsidy and socialism for the wealthy, who insists that Vietnam was no aberration but the calculated result of a bankrupt foreign policy, of people who work for a living and can't live on what they make and people who can't work and can't live on what we so graciously give, if all those could vote together or march together or even jump up and down and shout together, they could begin to build a force powerful enough to take control either in a peaceful, orderly fashion or by following the example of those who now exercise great power. That process begins by redefining what politics is, or rather, what it ought to be. It ought not be the art of the possible, as some of you may have learned in high school civics. And it ought not be the art of compromise, as you may have learned here in Political Science 101, which is civics taught by an older man. But it ought to be a new, more exciting, more exacting art, the art of seeing who gets how much of what from whom. Now, any group of people who have been powerless as long as we have must never be naive about the political process. 
It guaranteed no instant equality for the other ethnic Americans of an earlier century, and it will do no more for us. It is important, not in the abstract. Putting black people in positions of power without preparedness is useless. We have been taken by tokens too often. What is important is having something to say about what is being done to you and for you. That is what success at the art of politics will bring. The American political process has always been cyclical for blacks, a series of ups and downs. Its history is generally a negative one, a history of blacks proposing and whites disposing, a history with only one bright moment, the 10 years of Reconstruction, the only 10 years in American history in which an aggressive national government acted with armed might to protect the civil and political rights of black people, the only 10 years in American history when democracy began to mean as much in Mississippi as it always has meant in Maine, from the closing of that period of hope just before the beginning of the 20th century, the century whose problem Dr. Du Bois predicted would be the problem of the color line, to this point just past the middle of the 20th century, we have seen our political fortunes ebb and rise and now ebb again. From the days when Frederick Douglass said that the Republican Party is the ship and all else is the sea, to the days of Franklin Roosevelt, we have tried first one and now the other national political party. And we have been ill-served by a group of politicians whom the late Ralph McGill once characterized as so grotesque it seems impossible they could have been influential. But now the Vardamans and the Tillmans have gone from the scene. A new crop of national political leaders has begun the job they once thought was theirs alone, deciding on the proper political, educational, and economic position for the nation's black people. This new group marches backward like an off-key Salvation Army band, going into the field to convert the saved into sinners. This new group is made up of some old faces, a president who rose from the dead, a southern senator who has belonged to three political parties, a former attorney general who surely must be the first man in American history to hold his job, who could receive a standing ovation from an audience of adult white Mississippians. Just as that first reconstruction ended with a deal made in a hotel room, the second one ended that way too. A deal made in a hotel room in Miami Beach in 1968 that gave the white South veto power over Supreme Court nominees, gave them hope that the drive to register black voters would stop, and breathe new life into the national mood of resistance to progress for black people. Now the job of beginning again may not be done by black people alone, and certainly cannot be done by people who measure their social relevance by the length of their hair or the intricacy of their handshake. College campuses like this one used to be centers for movement and social protest. Today, more often than not, they are havens for the Boogaloo, Bidwist, and Boone's Farm. A great deal of today's fashionably long hair seems to be merely camouflage for yesterday's red necks. It is rather frightening to hear those who hide in the sometimes safety and temporary sanctuary of the college campus call, as some did last November, for the election of George Wallace as a means of heightening the contradictions and therefore hastening the revolution that's quite fine in infantile revolutionary theory, but it's my contradictions that are being heightened, not theirs. It is disturbing when people who could spend their time registering voters or organizing the unorganized choose instead to engage in esoteric debate about the relative revisionism of the late Ho Chi Minh. There is then a rather large job to be done. It may or may not succeed but it cannot even be attempted by a people who think they can smoke America to her knees. Even now, as the Congress of the United States daily demonstrates, 
It is either unable, unwilling, or impotent in the face of the presidential emasculation of the best of the last two presidential terms, the battle then begins to come home. As peace of a sort has come to part of Southeast Asia, the fight for peace must now come home. Winning this peace means finding the answer to the divisions that make the poor contentious and divided, that makes steel workers in Gary, Indiana blame black people in New York City for their unemployment, that makes new allies out of ancient enemies and stronger friends from historical sufferers. That is the magnitude of the task. It might take as its watchword some words written almost 70 years ago by Dr. Du Bois, who said, I believe in God who made of one blood all the races that dwell on the earth. I believe that all men, black and brown and white, are brothers, varying through time and opportunity, in form and gift and feature, but differing in no essential particular, and alike in soul, not sure about that, and in the possibility of infinite development. But especially do I believe in the Negro race, in the beauty of its genius, the sweetness of its soul, and its strength in that meekness which shall inherit this turbulent earth. I believe in the Prince of Peace. I believe that war is murder. I believe that armies and navies are at bottom the tinsel and braggadocio of oppression and wrong. And I believe that the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations by nations white and stronger, but foreshadows the death of their strength. I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and their souls, the right to breathe, the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, to enjoy the sunshine, to ride on the railroads uncursed by color, thinking, dreaming, working as they will in a kingdom of God and love. Thank you. There's a, there's a mic over here if anybody has any questions for Mr. Bond. I'm sure the majority of your audience is of the opinion that uh, Mr. Nixon is not a friend of the people, and I agree with that. And I'd like to know if you have any concrete suggestions for action, or are you just calling for basic uh, solidarity? No, because I don't think, uh, well, uh, I don't have very many concrete suggestions for action, because I'm not sure. Uh, whether or not there, are any, there exist in the country any groups of people who are ready to take any kind of action. My particular interest is in politics, which doesn't mean that I think anyone who does anything else is wrong or misguided or misdirected. But I should think anyone uh, going to a college in a big city like this that uh, has in the past uh, enjoyed the benefits of many of the federal programs that Mr. Nixon is now beginning to eliminate, would look at the vote taken in the Senate of the United States on yesterday, the refusal to override his veto, and to be worried about it. And uh, I would assume that the two senators from California voted on the right side of the issue, but that uh, obviously some 40-odd senators from someplace else didn't. So as one proposal for action, you, I think you have to begin now to discover why they didn't, uh, ask yourself whether or not they ought to remain in the U.S. Senate, and if you decide not, then try to begin to find some way to remove them the next time they come up for office. And the same with the members of the U.S. House who represent either California or uh, any other part of the country. You began your speech uh, almost apologizing for being a politician. Um, I just, I agreed with everything that you talked about. I didn't really think that you have to apologize for that. 
there are exception, exceptional politicians, uh, which brings me to the point I wanted to talk about Councilman Tom Bradley, who I believe to be an exceptional, exceptional po politician. Could you comment on the results of that race and what you see as happening? Well, first let me say something about my apology for being a politician. I honestly don't think it's necessary to apologize for being a politician. I think there's many honest and decent people in my profession as there are sitting out here in front of me. Uh, and that the rate of corruption, dishonesty, theft, graft, and uh, inhumanity is no greater on my side of the platform than it is on the other. So I don't at all feel bad about being in my profession. It is the world's second oldest profession. And uh, I know I belong to the finest body of men that money can buy. So I'm not at all apologetic about it at all. <coughs> and the thing, increasing number of politicians are beginning to realize that it really doesn't make any difference whether the people like us and vote for or against us. Because as long as they're not voting at all, we're free to go ahead and do whatever we choose in whatever manner we choose in whatever way we choose. So what the public thinks of us, as long as the public is inactive and quiescent, really doesn't make any difference at all. But in reference to Councilman Bradley, uh, I was out here only briefly four years ago during the campaign then. And it strikes me that he is in many ways a running a different kind of uh, campaign and is a different kind of person than he was then. Uh, I saw him last night when he uh, made his, uh, I guess, victory acceptance speech, and it just seemed to me like he was ready to uh, to go ahead and in eight weeks uh, dispatch Yorty and, uh, you know, be the mayor. He strikes me as a very, very fine man. I've known him for a long time, and he's the kind of man that brings class to the profession. And it's uh, really a shame, I think, that uh, people on the college campus tend increasingly to say all the politicians are no good, therefore I'm not going to vote. And then Mayor Yorty wins and they say, I told you they were no good. Uh, Mayor Yorty went ahead and won. Uh, Mr. Baum, would you be president? It's not would I be president, it's could I be president. And I think not. I was wondering if you could tell me how you react to the candidacy of Huey Newton for the mayor of Oakland. Not very well, it's because it's Bobby Seale. Uh, that, I think it's, it's uh, very helpful from what I know of, what the, of what's going on in Oakland, uh, that he's running a very vigorous and uh, very hard campaign. There is one danger inherent in someone who for most of his public life has been doing one thing beginning to do another. Now there are three or four candidates in Oakland so presumably Bobby Seale could be first through fourth. Suppose uh, he happens to do very very poorly and doesn't get many votes at all which is always a possibility in any kind of election and then suppose on the next day after the election the Black Panther Party in Oakland goes to uh, the city council and says we want to run a breakfast program in a residential neighborhood and you need to give us a zoning variance. And the city council will say well we would have done it but you just put your program before the people and they repudiated it. Not only did they repudiate it but your own people didn't go for you and if your own people won't go for you then why should we? So I think there's a built-in danger that if he does poorly he'll give many people an excuse uh, for not supporting the very worthwhile things that the Black Panther Party does. And if he wins, then Oakland will be a better city. <clears throat> uh, how do you stand uh, regarding the, the farm workers' uh, uh, strike here in California uh, and the boycott of non-union lettuce, which is being sold all over Westwood and all over California and even in Georgia and everywhere? Uh, do you support the uh, the uh, the boycott of uh, non-union lettuce by the uh, United Farm Workers? Yes. How you doing? How you do? Right. Yeah. I um I came here today, you know, with fully the intention of uh of asking you, you know, like given the um, respective histories of both the uh, Republican and the Democratic parties, how you could, you know, remain a part of the uh, Democratic Party. But since you more or less cleared that up in my mind by calling for uh, the fashioning or the formation 
of a Democratic with a small d party, which is, you know, basically what I'm for, too. Then I won't trouble you on that. But um, what I will ask you for is, is a couple of clarifications. Now, I, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you said that the uh, basis for this party would, uh, or at least you inferred it, that the basis, uh, the uh, foundation for this party would be the, uh, would be the um, black people in America and that we must form uh, uh, alliances and coalitions with other non-white and other oppressed peoples. You know, is that correct so yes. far? Yes. Right. Okay, well, I see a, a fundamental problem in that. And that's, uh, uh, you know, just like my man here who just got uh, through, uh, through talking about the, uh, the letter strike. Now, I don't see that as being, you know, like a Chicano problem. I see that as being, you know, like a human problem. I see that as being my problem. And it's the uh, same thing, it's the same type of problem that would arise, you know, with uh, uh, predicating the existence of a political party upon a splintered base. That is, you know, like uh, uh, having the brothers, having the blacks as being, you know, like your major force and forming alliances. Rather than doing it from the, from the sake of alliances or from coalitions, I think that the, uh, the problem, you know, is one which necessitates uh, a fundamentally class outlook. That is the unification of all oppressed peoples. Uh, against you know the oppressors, you know because like I think that if uh, uh, that if we we start off on the uh, on the standpoint on the basis, and this this is from my experiences, you know this is not not simply and solely from what I've read, but this is also from the uh, from the things that I've been involved in my, in my my relatively short life, you know. But if you start off on the basis of uh, 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 projecting the uh, um, the uh, uh, the spirit or the uh, uh, abilities or the uh, uh, oppression of one particular set of people and making those as primary and seeing the uh, particular abilities, the particular spirit, the particular oppression of other peoples as being secondary and subordinate, inevitably contradictions will arise between the primary and the secondary. Inevitably, your, force, your forces will be splintered. So, um, I mean, I, th I think you're essentially correct in what you're calling for and I support you. And uh, um, I intend to do work, you know, like uh, along that lines myself. Uh, but uh, um, I think that it, 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 what I'm saying really deserves, you know, like just a, a bit more thought. And I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, with a bit more thought, you'll come to the same conclusions that we are all one people, that we are all oppressed. Well, I think you may be essentially correct, but the the different the difficulty with making a solely class analysis of the difficulties non-white people black people particularly face in the united states is that the other groups of people uh, who fit into our economic class but who don't share the added burden of race first don't generally have the kind of class consciousness you would desire and secondly allow their class perceptions to be clouded by race you know it's an old old dream of people on the left in this country to build a, a working class or a lower class coalition of all the people all the downtrodden and the oppressed and there have been a couple uh, in recent years last couple of years in fact in mississippi of examples of black and white woodcutters uh, coming together and seeing that they have a common problem and the problem is economic in that particular circumstance and not racial. And that may be the harbinger of an eventual uh, larger coalition of many, many blacks and many, many whites. But all the past experience and history of such coalitions, including in Georgia, where one of the most vibrant uh, populist movements ever existed under the leadership of Tom Watson, uh, thousands upon thousands of black and white small farmers and workers coming together and building a massive political movement foundered on the shoals of racism. The leader, Tom Watson, became a vicious anti-Semite, anti-Catholic, anti-black. The whole, uh, the white segment of the coalition split away over the issue of race. The blacks found themselves friendless uh, uh, without uh, uh, anyone with whom to coalesce. And that's why I said open-ended coalition. It's uh, not very likely to me, but it's conceivable to me that black people in uh, this city might find some very weird and exotic group. Uh, with whom on a particular point and at a particular point in time interests merge and at another point in time it's it becomes another group so uh, that's why I think you have to first coalesce with yourself secondly look for others who share your economic or racial circumstance with whom to coalesce and thirdly then look for larger and broader groups with whom to coalesce Okay. Mr. Bond, yes. What, what uh, are your opinions on the Watergate affair? The Watergate affair. 
Well, I think it's what it is. That President Nixon hired these men to go break in the Watergate, and they got caught, and now they're faced with doing a lot of time in the slam, and one by one they're coming apart, and it'll all come out sooner or later. Uh, do you think that when uh, the true facts do come out, that it will have any effect upon the, uh, the people who voted for Nixon, or what? No, they don't care. The American level of outrage, see, has been raised so high. It used to be many years ago that if you were sitting at home, not you particularly, but if you were sitting at home and you saw a policeman beating somebody black with a club, you would be horrified and say, my God, so what is he doing? This is scandalous, outrageous. So we can't tolerate this. But now you see that so often. And the war was on TV every day at six o'clock, you know, bringing all that carnage and destruction right in to up to your dinner table. The people are no longer horrified now by things which once horrified them. I think if it were discovered that President Nixon had been sitting in the, in the Howard Johnsons across the street from the Watergate watching, that people wouldn't care too much. It's, some of them would say, I don't believe it, and others would say, well, he was probably just trying to get away from Pat for the evening, and uh, others would say, well, even if he was there, he's the president, and you have to support him because he's the only president we have. <laughs> One other question. Uh, you know, we have the, the meat boycott going on right now. What is your opinion on uh, how this affects black people? Well, not too many of us own these big feedlots, and uh, d declining numbers of blacks work in the packing industry, uh, but it affects us. The boycott may not as affect us as much as the price of meat. I try not to eat too much meat anyway myself. It's really not very good for you, you know. Not just pork, but meat generally is not really that good for you anyway. So I'm trying very slowly to stop eating uh, all meat. I don't think the boycott itself has much effect on blacks, except uh, many people say if you don't buy red meat, buy chicken, and we tend to buy a lot of chicken anyway, so. Thank you. I think I've been told that this will have to be the last question. Um, about it, a year ago, I'm not sure exactly uh, what talk show it was, and you can tell me if I misquote you or not. Uh, you said that during the time Martin Luther King was alive, you were very firmly dedicated to nonviolence as a means of solving solutions, of solving problems in this country. And then in the talk show, you said after he had died, you were not so firmly dedicated to nonviolence as the sole uh, solution to these types of problems. Could you explain that first? Well, what I said was it didn't really, my decision not to be nonviolent didn't turn on Dr. King's death. It's just that in 1960, 61, 62, and 63, uh, nonviolence to me was not only a morally correct stance to hold, but also a tactically correct stance to hold. I mean, it just made sense if you were in a small town in rural Mississippi that uh, discretion was the better part of valor. And uh, since then, I've, my notions of myself and uh, what I would do if someone struck me or, you know, how I just have changed, it really didn't have too much to do with Dr. King's death. Um, I just uh, changed the way I viewed myself, really. Uh, and uh, I still think nonviolence is an acceptable tactic in certain circumstances, and, uh, not, and not in others. But uh, no longer, I used to consider myself a pacifist, for example, and say that I wouldn't bear arms, I wouldn't fight, and wouldn't uh, uh, hope that in an extreme situation wouldn't strike anyone else, or wouldn't harm anyone else. And now I'm, uh, I'm no longer sure that I either could do that or that I'd always want to do that. Thank you all.